Good morning. morning. It's just fun to do. I'm I'm ready to go, y'all. I'm fired up. I don't know. This might be dangerous for all of us. If you will turn with me to Daniel chapter 9, we're going to try to get into it as quickly as possible here, uh, just for, for time constraints. Uh, when, when we came to the book of Daniel, I think all of us as pastors were, were secretly praying that we would not get this particular chapter to preach from, so spiritually I think I may have drawn the shortest straw. I'm just joking. Uh, but as we come to Daniel chapter 9, there are a lot of things in it that have been hotly debated for years in Christianity. And uh, some, some things that, uh, that really, ultimately, we will have to, uh, some of us will have to agree to disagree on or just uh, let God's mystery reign in some of these things. But as much as possible, as we get into this text today, it would be great for us to, to actually come to God asking him to reveal to us some things that, that we need a better understanding of. Now, you may be coming here this morning having no prior experience with Daniel chapter 9, and that's okay. That's probably actually better to come to this passage of Scripture with a clean slate rather than years and years of of misunderstandings. So as we come to this today, we want to ask God to rule and reign in our hearts and in our minds and to let the Holy Spirit speak to us. Uh, before, we, before we go into it, I want to read a, a poem by William Cowper. Uh, if you don't know who Cowper was, he was a hymnodist and, and a poet and a believer. And uh, he wrote a poem called God Moves in a Mysterious Way. And this, it'll become a little bit clearer later uh, why I've chosen this particular poem to begin with. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable unfathomable minds of never-failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. Cowper talks about God as moving in a mysterious way and God being his own interpreter and making it plain. And as we come to where Daniel is at in chapter 9, we find that that Daniel is confused. He's he's beginning to wonder when God is going to move in the way that, that he has promised to move. But in the middle of Daniel's prayer for mercy and, and pleas for understanding, what we find is, is what God is actually doing throughout history is much, much bigger than any of us on a human level could understand or comprehend. God does move in a mysterious way in the course of history, and he's actually his own interpreter. Everything that we are confused about, everything that there might still be mystery on in scriptures, God will ultimately make it plain, and he'll do it in the sight of the entire world. You know, one of the questions that we have when we think about texts like this, passages of Scripture like this, and and then start to think about what's going on in the world today, one of the questions that we ask is, what in the world is God doing? I mean, we are at a very, all of us, I think, whatever point in time in history you're alive in, I think every generation has said, man, things seem to be much worse than they've ever been, right? Right? Like if, if, especially if you're paying attention to what's been going on in the Middle East for years, and especially with all the movement and the moves that Russia has been making, I know that there are even some, some very famous uh, Bible teachers who are now coming out and saying, yep, this is it. It's all coming to a head. It's all coming to an end. And I, I know many people who would, who would join these teachers in that and saying, you know what, this must be it. Russia's making moves, and uh, the, the Bible in certain passages seems to talk about Russia, so maybe, maybe we're closer now than ever to Jesus coming back. Well, first of all, I would propose to you that every day that goes past, we're closer to Jesus coming back. 
But in general, is this, is this really true? When we look at these passages of Scripture, when we look at the world today, can we really say that we're in the last days? Like, is this, is this it? Is it so bad now because God's going to wrap everything up and he's going to finally you know, reward us by getting us out of this terrible world? Well, I, I just want to share a story with you about an experience that I had with, with sort of freaking out about the last days. When I was in middle school, January 16th, 1991. I don't know if anybody, anybody remembers January 16th, 1991, but I remember sitting in front of the television absolutely convinced that the end of the world was coming. George H.W. Bush was on the screen announcing that we were going to be embarking in the Persian Gulf War. How many of you guys remember that? I remember as a middle school student growing up in conservative Baptist uh, circles, I was terrified because I was absolutely convinced that I would never live to see 20 years old. Jesus was going to come back. It was so prevalent that I began actually having like terrible nightmares about the end of the world. And, and I, was, I was so freaked out that 1991 would be the last year of humanity. Well, it appears I was wrong. But you understand how we do this, right? Like every major thing that happens in the world as history goes on, most of us as believers jump to, well, this must be, it's so bad now, this must be the time when, when God's going to do something great. Because at our core, the question that we really have is, is if God is truly in control, why are things so bad here on earth? If God is really in control of history, why do we live in a world in which terrible things are continually happening that don't seem to make much sense? Well, the hope that we have is actually brought to us in Scripture and especially by apocalyptic literature. This is the question that apocalyptic literature answers when we come to the book of Daniel, when we come to the book of Revelation. The question that get answered, gets answered is, if God is in control, why are all these things happening? Why does it seem like the world is falling apart if God is really in control of history? And apocalyptic literature is, is more about hope for the future then it is a chronological list of things that are going to happen in the future. Do you understand? Like many of us, especially if you've grown up in conservative Christian circles, when we come to Daniel, when we come to Revelation, what we're normally looking for is we want to see everything that's going to happen. When is, uh, when is society going to fall apart? When is the Antichrist going to come? How do we know when these things are going to happen? And in similar fashion to the, the Thessalonians, if you read through First and Second Thessalonians, you get this sense that these people were basically sitting around waiting to see when God was going to wrap everything up, to which... Paul ultimately tells him, look, here's generally what's going to happen, but get back to work. Live. See, apocalyptic literature is more about giving us hope for the future than God giving us a chronological list of exactly what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. And this is a misunderstanding that we have when we come to this type of literature. The hope that is ultimately given to all of God's people through this literature is that God will be God and the whole world will know it. God will be God and the whole world will know it. And as we come to the book of Daniel, we're coming to God's people in exile. So if we're really going to understand the significance of, of what God is announcing that he's going to do in the future, we have to come to these texts with an understanding of what this would have meant to Daniel. You see, when we get these, in, especially in Daniel chapter 9, what a lot of w us do is we run to verses 24 through 27. We want to know exactly what the 70 weeks means. But what we're missing is, is the context of not only this chapter, but the book. There's much going on in the first part of Daniel chapter 9. And if we start to take these apocalyptic texts and only pull out the sections that seem to be sensationalistic, what, what we're doing is we're divorcing the scripture from its primary culture and the intent of the author. And when we do that, what this scripture becomes, it, 
any portion of scripture divorced from its primary culture and the intent of the author is a homeless child wandering the streets, vulnerable to violent abuses. When we will come to apocalyptic texts and just take out these sections that seem to have information about the future, we, we pull it out of the context. We pull it out of what the author is actually trying to say. We, pull, we put our own meanings into it, our own understandings, our own presuppositions into it, instead of simply letting God speak to us. So as we come to these things today, we want to be humble. That perhaps Daniel chapter 9 is more than just about some, some epochs of time and some information about when things are going to happen and more about the hope that God has for us in the course of human history. So let's look at da Daniel chapter 9. The first thing we get in Daniel chapter 9 is an intimate look at prayer. Overall, we get an idea of prayer and prophecy, which is sort of the title of our sermon today, prayer and prophecy. You join me in Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to read through, um, read through these first verses here. I'm going to try to uh, get through these as quickly as possible. We've got a lot of text to cover. Um, so join me in Jan Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Aserus, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeing him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame, as at this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away in all the lands to which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame, to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven, there has not been anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore, God, the Lord has kept ready the calamity and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned and we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now, therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolations in the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Let's pray. 
Father, as we come to your word today, we need great understanding. We need great insight. Lord, help us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Open our hearts to be able to understand your word and then receive it by application. Lord, we pray that if there's anyone in here today that doesn't know the glory and majesty of Jesus Christ and has not had Christ applied to their hearts by faith, today would be the day where the veil is lifted and their eyes are able to see the glorious truth that you have revealed yourself in your Son. Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, so as we come to this great plea to God, we begin with Daniel's prayer in verses 1 through 19, which is what we just read. Daniel is praying here with an intimate understanding of the covenant promises of God to his people. As you read through verses 1 through 19, what gets missed a lot of times, people will run immediately to the 70 weeks. But what we miss is the context of how Daniel is praying. Daniel is praying with an understanding of the covenant that God made with Israel. He references Jeremiah. I perceived in the words of Jeremiah that Israel was going to be exiled for 70 years. Daniel knows the prophecies of Jeremiah. Daniel also references the law of Moses and the covenant that God had made with the Israelites through his servant Moses. This is very important for us understanding the last half of the text in this passage. Daniel's not just sort of praying out there, God, I wish you'd make things better here. I wish you'd make things better for your people. Daniel has an, a very deep insight into the promises of both blessing and cursing that God gave to the Israelites that were dependent on their obedience. And so Daniel is, is moved to pray. This is a man who has lived almost his entire life in exile. And when he considers the words of Jeremiah, don't you think that he was like, wait a minute, 70, 70? Oh, this should be just about, maybe, maybe God has completed his exile and maybe now finally we can go home and maybe now finally God will make Jerusalem a wonderful place again. Maybe now finally God will rebuild his sanctuary and put himself on display in front of the whole world. Daniel was longing for the time when God's name would be made great. And specifically, as we look at, at 29.10, Jeremiah 29.10. This is one of the passages that would have been popped up in Daniel's mind. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. Now, remember, remember when, when I said if we start to pull texts out and just divorce them from their primary context, this is one of those things that happens is when we come to the book of Jeremiah. See, Daniel comes to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, and knows that this is something that God has promised to his people. And this is just a caution for us as, as believers. When we come to texts in the Bible and immediately pull them out and ask what they mean to us today, we, we confuse what God is actually communicating. Now, I want to be very sensitive about the way that I say this, but there are a lot of people who will take a passage of Scripture from the Old Testament, and specifically Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you, right? And there are a lot of us who are like, man, that's a good verse for me. L folks, that verse is not, in, a, in an ethereal sense, it is for you. But that verse in its context was applied to Israel. God says, Israel, I know the plans I have for you. And unless you've lived in the Babylonian captivity, you don't really have an understanding of what Jeremiah 29, 11 is really saying. This is what Jeremiah is looking at. This is, this is what Daniel is looking back to. The, God's word to the Israelites for what he's going to do in the future. And as we come to this text with an understanding of, of what God has promised in the past, then we can understand more what God is doing in the future. Daniel also sort of harkens back to Deuteronomy. You see a, a few times in there he mentions the law of Moses or the servant Moses. In Deuteronomy 28 verse 37, Moses actually says, if you do not obey the Lord and follow the Lord this day, you will become a byword, which is language that Daniel says. We have become a byword. It was promised to Moses that if Israel did not obey God's laws, God clearly said, look, I love you. I've called you out. But if you follow my word, I will bless you. If you disobey me, I will curse you. I will send you into exile until you repent. 
And so this whole prayer, Daniel is praying with an understanding that God was very clear to Israel that if they were going to be disobedient, he would send them into exile until they repented. God would not fully restore them until they repented. And what we also see in this prayer is Daniel clearly acknowledges that Israel has not yet repented. So when we, when we come to this text and look to these 70 weeks here in a minute and immediately apply all these wonderful things that God is doing for Israel, we miss what Daniel is saying. Israel to this point has not repented. Do you see that? Daniel says, to us belongs open shame. We have still not repented for our iniquity. We have still not returned to you. Daniel is praying with a covenant understanding of what God had promised. And I want to take you back to Deuteronomy 28. If you can, you can flip there really quick. I want to show you something. Deuteronomy 28, specifically verses... Um, let's go 62 and 63... Whereas, and this is Moses, remember this is in the context of the covenant given to Israel. Whereas you were as numerous as the stars of heaven, you shall be left few in number because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God. Do you see what God is promising to them because of their disobedience? You will be left few in number because you did not obey. And as the Lord took delight in doing you good and multiplying you, so the Lord will take delight in bringing ruin upon you and destroying you. And you shall be plucked off the land that you are entering to take possession of it. God was serious with the Israelites when he said, if you do not obey, if you do not follow, I'm going to bring destruction on you. And as, if we turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 25, then the people will say, it is because they abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt and went and served other gods and worshiped them, gods who they not, had not known and whom he had not allotted to them. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land, bringing upon it all the curses written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and fury and great wrath and cast them into another land as they are this day. When we come Come to the exile and Daniel's prayer to God. Daniel is crying out to God for mercy because to this point, Israel has not. Daniel is going to God as a representative of Israel, asking that God will make his name great. See, Daniel sees, he, he says, look, Jerusalem is in ruins. Your, your sanctuary, your temple by which you made your presence known among the Israelites, it's in ruins. How will the world ever know that you are great when your people are suffering? And isn't this what we ask as Christians today? God, how will the world ever know that you are great when your people are in suffering? How will the world ever know of your majesty if you, if you don't show up and, and show them how much you love your people? Daniel says, God, when are you going to make your name great? And as we look at Daniel's prayer one of the things by way of application that we can be helped by as we look at Daniel's prayers, there's, there's a few things that I just want to walk you through. As we look at Daniel's prayer, what true prayer really is? What is the heart of a prayer from someone who is intimately connected with God? What does this prayer look like? For, first thing is this. True prayer is always in response to God's word. Why did Daniel begin to pray? Daniel began to pray because he perceived in the word promises that God had made. See, as we come to God to lay out our requests before him, it should always be in response to his word. Jesus said, don't be like the Gentiles who heap up empty phrases, hoping that you'll be heard because you threw out these wonderfully, beautifully flowery phrases. In fact, Jesus just says, look, there's a very simple way to pray, and he teaches them the Lord's Prayer, right? Look, all prayer should really start with our hearts focused on God's word. I say you can never go wrong if you open up God's word and you're praying to him what he's already written. Amen? His Holy Spirit helps us understand it and we can pray that back to him. The second thing is this. Prayers, true prayer really should always be identified with God's people. As Daniel prays, you don't see Daniel going, I and me. You see him saying, we and us. And you may think, well, you know what, though? Salvation is for us individually. And as people of God, we should be able to go to God and say, God, help me, help me. Look, I understand that. But even as we come to the New Testament, when they say, Jesus' followers say, teach us how to pray, Jesus doesn't say, my Father, who art in heaven, does he? He says, pray like this, our Father, who art in heaven, right? Give, give me this day my daily bread, right? 
No, give us this day our daily bread. A lot of times as we pray, we, we take it individually, right? Daniel could go to God and be like, God, get me out of this. But he doesn't. He goes to God and he says, to us belong open shame. When will you, when will you work for your people called by your name? You understand, like, true prayer is not just individualistic. It's identified with God's people. What would our prayers be like if we went to God with the phrase, like, his people or your people instead of just me? What would our prayer life be like if we were constantly going to God and receiving for others rather than just going to God asking for things for ourselves. I think it would change us. The third thing is that prayer is humbled by God's righteousness. Daniel says, I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession. See, prayer should always have a confessional nature about it. We are sinful human beings. Daniel acknowledges this. To us belong open shame. To us belong open shame. We have sinned. You are great. We are not. And prayer is fueled by this, humbled by God's righteousness. Confession has a very important place in our prayers. We don't come to God just busting through saying, like, you owe me, God. Now, we come under the righteous covering of Jesus Christ, and we come knowing that when God looks at us as believers, he sees the righteousness of Christ. But we also come with an understanding that because we're still human, because we still struggle with the flesh, we still sin, and we still need to be repentant when we come to our great God and Savior. And this is what Daniel is showing us. Prayer also needs to be inspired by God's character We are often confused in prayer because we have not spent a lot of time considering the one to whom which we are praying. Daniel knows God's character. He knows what God has promised. He knows who God is. And there is a great humility and reverence about Daniel's prayer that we see that we can learn much from. In fact, if you read the entire book of Daniel, uh, you can get much about how to pray by watching Daniel pray. And we've seen that and we'll continue to see that. And the last thing we see in in Daniel's prayer that can be a a help to us is that true prayer should always be focused on God's glory. I want you to look at a couple of things. Uh, One would be verse 17. He says, Therefore, God, listen to the prayer of your servant to his pleas for mercy and for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. For your own sake. For your own sake. When we come to God, when we are coming asking for things, are we going to God asking primarily that what he does would be to put his name on display? Or are we merely asking for things that would put our name on display? Daniel comes to God saying, don't, look, make your name great. And I wonder how many of us could learn from that. Knowing God intimately presents itself in our prayers, asking him to do whatever will make his name most great, even if that means our suffering. Even if that means us being uncomfortable. Whatever God you will do, do to make your name great. And this was Daniel's ultimate prayer. At the end of Daniel's prayer, what we see is, is this idea. Look at verse 19. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Don't delay for your own sake because your city and your people are called by your name. See, Daniel is praying again. He's praying with this understanding that how will the nations know that God is great? Israel is in exile in Babylon, and they're a byword. People look at the Israelites and say, what's the big deal with Israel? They're in captivity. How powerful can this God be when his own people are languishing? And Daniel says, make your name great. When will you restore your city, your people? Do you understand? And yes, Daniel is praying, God, make Israel great again. Make your nation great again. The hope of the Messiah was that Israel would become great as a nation and that God would be on display because Israel as a nation was great. That was the understanding of the Jewish people. And so as Daniel prays, the next thing we see is a great answer from God. Verses 20 through 23, read with me. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. That's important. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out. And I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. God delights 
to show off his plan to his people. Daniel says, God, when are you going to make your name great? And Daniel, as he's praying, he says, while I was speaking, the man, the angel Gabriel came to me and basically said, from the time you started praying, a word went out and God sent me to give you understanding. What does that show us? God desires, longs for his people to say to him, God, when will you make your name great? And he shows up and says, I want to declare it to you. God is is anxious to declare his plan to Daniel. Daniel says, God, make your name great. When will you do it? And Gabriel says, I'm here to tell you how he's going to do it. God delights in using his angelic messengers. And incidentally, the other times that we see Gabriel, Gabriel mentioned by name in Scripture are the times when he's announcing the coming of Jesus Christ the Messiah. Specifically, when we see him given by name. So, you know, there, there is a little thing in here where perhaps when Gabriel shows up to, to give an interpretation of prophecy, maybe it's about Jesus. Just maybe. Maybe. E.M. Bounds, who has wrote wonderful things on prayer, has said, God employs these glorious heavenly intelligences in the blessed work of hearing and answering prayer when the prayer, as in the case of Daniel on this occasion, has to do with the present and future welfare of his people. Daniel was praying about the present and future welfare of God's people. He's been remembering God's covenant, and God is eager to answer Daniel, though it is most likely more than Daniel could understand or expect. And this is when we get a great prophecy from God. And this, verses 24 through 27, is where classically in Christianity we've seen a lot of confusion. And I think it's because we misunderstand the entire context of Daniel chapter 9. This is when people are most likely to say, see, all this... Daniel wanted to know about Israel. So all this stuff is about what God is going to do with Israel as a nation. But folks, as we read through the scriptures, it should be very clear to us that the primary way in which God has displayed his glory is not through Israel as a nation. The primary way in which God has displayed his glory in history is through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. There's no way to dispute that. So when God says, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do with my city and my people, and he sends Gabriel to Daniel, I believe that this prophecy is showing off the purpose of God's plan, which is much greater than just taking this for a literal outlaying of chronological events. Look at this in in verse 24. Seventy weeks are decreed. Remember, Daniel was praying about when the 70 years were going to be over. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, put an end to sin, atone for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal vision and profit, and anoint a most holy place. See, verse 24 is the purpose, the purpose of God's plan. If we just camp in verse 24... If we don't try to rush on and see exactly chronologically when, you know, what's, when is the Antichrist coming and what does this last three and a half mean? If we just start with verse 24 and say, what is God's purpose in this prophecy to Daniel? We can uncover much. The number seven is really important, right? If you've ever read scripture from cover to cover, the number seven is really important. How many days was the earth, uh, and the earth and the heavens and everything created in? How many days did God complete creation? Right? The totality of it rested on the seventh day. Seven, right? Seven is, signifies the number of completeness or perfection in Scripture. When we see the number seven, that's why when you see the number given to man in the book of Revelation is 666, that signifies it's not complete, it's not perfect, it's less than perfect. It's the number of man versus the number of God, which is perfection, seven. Listen, numbers in apocalyptic literature are really important, but from a symbolic sense, right? When we come to apocalyptic literature, we can't necessarily look at everything and say, there's got to be literal. It's got to be literal. Literally, a seven-headed dragon is going to come out of the water with a harlot riding on its back. Do we know that that could be possible literally? It could be, I guess. But is that the point of what Revelation unfolds, right? What is the point of what God is sharing? What is the purpose of his plan? Numbers in apocalyptic literature are not just randomly chosen. The number seven is important in signifying completeness. If we look at God's declaration of the 70 years of exile as an understanding of completeness of punishment, then we don't get mired down in trying to figure out when was the date that they actually got out of exile. So Daniel knew that they were, 70 years was going to be up soon. So 70 years is up, and Daniel's like, okay, God, 70 years. Is that what was happening, or was Daniel simply going to God and saying, is it complete yet? Have you decided the completeness of Israel's punishment yet? Has it fulfilled the time that you have decided? 
Seventy sevens here, or when it says 70 weeks, what the, the real translation would be 70 sevens, right? Which is different than 70 years. Daniel says, what about the 70 years? God sends Gabriel, and Gabriel, Gabriel says 70 sevens. Now listen, this is most likely a literary phrase rather than a literal phrase. Now, depending on how you grew up, some of you may be very, very mad at me right now for that, okay? But listen, hear me out on this. When Peter goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, how many times should I forgive this guy? What does Jesus say? 70 times what? 70 times 7. So Jesus was telling Peter 490 times, and we get to 490, cut it off. Would any of us take that interpretation in a historical narrative? Would Jesus talking to Peter? No, we wouldn't. We would say Jesus was just signifying you forgive until there's complete forgiveness. So why would we come to Daniel when we see 77s and immediately go, that means 490? It doesn't make any sense, folks. It doesn't make any sense. It's to signify completeness, to signify this sort of symbolic jubilee cycle. If you want to study more about that, you can look up jubilee cycles. If you want to just write this down, look up jubilee cycles, Daniel chapter 9, and you can read a lot about how this sort of reflects the, the Sabbath understanding of a jubilee cycle. But let's not miss the purpose, okay? Verse 24 gives us the purpose of what unfolds in verses 25, 26, and 27. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal both vision and prophet, and anoint a most holy place. Now listen, God plans everything. One of the things that we see for sure and is in God's response to Daniel when Daniel says, uh, we've been desolate. Gabriel shows up and he gives this prophecy and the, the word that keeps popping up, popping up is decreed, 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 decreed. God has decreed human history. We can trust in the Lord because when we ask the question, if things are so bad, why is God not doing anything? We get this answer. God is doing something. He has been doing something. All these things, as bad as they may seem, have been planned from the beginning of time, including the death of his son, Jesus Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So we never have to worry that things are not in control because God has said he is. That's great hope for Daniel. God doesn't say, well, I think generally this might be what happens as long as people cooperate with me. Is that what God says? No, he says, I've decreed these things to happen. And guys, if we don't see God's sovereignty in Scripture, we're not reading God's Word. It's all over it. It's painted all over the text. The purpose that we see in verse 24 it's sort of comprised of six things. Six things. And it's a covenant understanding. Finish the transgression, put an end to sin, atone for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal the vision and prophet, anoint a most holy place. And when Daniel was hearkening back to Jeremiah 29, he also, we know, has to be hearkening back to Jeremiah 31, where God clearly promises a new covenant in which no longer will they need to be taught by one another because God will write it on their hearts. He will impress it on their hearts. His law will be on their hearts. No more will they have to follow the law. As Paul has said, the law was a tutor to lead me to who? Christ. And so in verse 24, Daniel says, God, how are you going to make your name great? I believe God says through Jesus, the Messiah. In verse 24, all these things that I will accomplish will ultimately show themselves in Christ. When we miss the essence of Daniel's prayer, we miss the fullness of the purpose of this prophecy. God is showing Daniel the link between the present and the eternal. How will he fulfill his covenant promises? In Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 4, this is very important in understanding this. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, if you read the book of Hebrews after reading this passage of scripture, you can get a great deal of insight. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by who? By the prophets. Now check this next part out. But in these what? Last, we've been living in the last days a long time, haven't we? At least since the author of Hebrews was writing about Jesus. In these last days he has spoken to us by whom? His son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through him also he created the world. Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies of God. As we come to the text, a lot of times what happens in the 70 weeks is people want to make this about national Israel. But here's the deal. Jesus was never plan B. Jesus wasn't like God says, Israel, I've got something for you. If you buff it up, 
I got to send Jesus in. Jesus is the third string quarterback that comes in to save the game. No! Jesus is it. He is the plan. He is the fulfillment of every prophecy. Revelation 19.10, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When we come to prophetic texts in the Old Testament, when we come to prophetic texts in the New Testament, they all find their fulfillment in whom? In Jesus. Ultimately, they find their fulfillment in Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 8, we see this unfolding even more. As it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since in it, it is enacted on better promises. If that, and I want you to see this, please see this. If that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. God himself, the author of Hebrews is saying, look, if that first covenant that God had made with Israel, if that had been faultless, if that had been the way in which God was going to move in history, there would have been no need to enact a second. But even in the Old Testament, even in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses speaks of this new covenant. He says to the Israelites, let God circumcise your heart. The circumcision of, of the, the flesh was never meant to really lead us to an understanding of God that's a fullness of God. Even Moses said, circumcised in heart. The new covenant is all about being circumcised in heart. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, I will put my laws into their minds, write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people." And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord. They shall all know me from the least to the greatest. I will be merciful towards their iniquities. I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. When we come to these 70 weeks in this prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, there are a lot of people that want to make this about Israel as a nation. I just don't see it. If you read the whole of Scripture in its context, God himself says that old covenant itself had fault in it because there was no way that human beings, even if they're given the full law of God, there is no way that a sinful human being can be fully righteous. So God sent Christ to fulfill the law, to fulfill the sacrifice of the law, to atone for sin. This is what we see unfolding in these purposes here in, 20, in 24. I want to read you something by Sinclair Ferguson. He says, It is almost instinctive to the New Testament Christian to see in these statements a prophecy of the work of Christ. The first three goals of the purpose deal with removing sin. Look at the first three goals. What are the first three? Finish the transgression, put an end to sin, atone for iniquity. These first three goals we see fulfilled as Christ removing sin, the already and the not yet. Hebrews 9, 26 through 28. He says, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. To put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So in verse 24, Daniel 9, 24, and we see to, to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin. Who put an end to sin? Jesus. What was the problem that the Israelites were in? Why was God's name not being great? Because the Israelites were rejecting God. They were sinning greatly. And the whole reason for the new covenant was so that God could show humanity the world is not messed up because something is wrong with God. The world is messed up because there's something wrong with us. We, we get upset about God when we fix everything. We screwed it up. You understand that? We, we come to these things, and even as Christians, we come with a lack of understanding and knowledge about the depth of our sin and how much we needed to be atoned for, how much our sin had to be paid for, because we couldn't do it. And so when Daniel prays to God and says, when will you make your name great? God says, I will make my name great. It's not going to be in the way that you think. I'm going to put an end to sin. Christ became the curse to take the curse for his people. In the Old Testament, what we see is the way in which it says, cursed is a man who hangs on a tree, right? And then we get that Christ became a curse 
to take away the curse of sin. The curses of the old covenant on the transgressions of Israel could never be removed by the sacrifice of lambs and goats. They could never be removed fully. So Christ came and gave his life, perfect sacrifice, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world became a curse. The most grotesque thing in the, in the human history is that Christ, who knew no sin, became a curse, was cut off from the Father. He took the full wrath of God poured because of our sin, because of Israel's sin. And the only way, the only way that God's name can be truly magnified greatly throughout all of human history is focused on the cross of Jesus Christ. It's focused on the cross. This is what's being revealed to Daniel. The second three goals in this verse 24 deal with restoring righteousness. It says to bring in everlasting righteousness. In Romans 1, 16 and 17, we get that the gospel is what reveals God's righteousness. God's righteousness is revealed through the gospel. Christ ushers in everlasting righteousness. Now, again, we get an already and not yet. In verse 24, the reason that this prophecy is, is sort of being laid out is because Jesus accomplishes these things in one sense that, in that he's ruling and reigning now. But there will be a, f- a future consummation of all these things at the end of all time as well. It also says that both prophet and vision will be sealed. And we've already discussed all prophecy finds its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus, right? The canon of Scripture is closed. We need nothing else added to Scripture. We have God's Word, the finality of it, from Genesis to Revelation. Guys, we are living before the end of the book of Revelation. You realize that, right? We are living still in the middle of Scripture, really. We are waiting for the final consummation of all the things that God has promised, but all these things find their fulfillment in Christ. And the last thing we see is anoint a most holy place. Now, sometimes traditionally you'll look at this text and people in verses 25 through 27 will say, well, the most holy place means God's going to set up another sanctuary. He's going to set up another temple and sacrifice is going to go on and the Antichrist is going to show up and he's going to end the sacrifice. And again, I say to you, why in the world when God says that the old, the old covenant is imperfect, that the, the blood of goats and lambs will never atone for sin, why in the world would God set that up again after Jesus? I just, I just don't get it. I don't get it. I don't see it. Do you understand? But we come to this passage with a, with a presupposition of what this means. I think it's all about Jesus. And then in verses 25 through 27, we get the permanence of God's plan. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this because, again, I don't want us to miss the big picture. I think this whole text is God pointing Daniel to Christ, not pointing Daniel to the nation of Israel, pointing Daniel to Christ. His ultimate plan, the permanence of God's plan. Look at verses 25 through 27. Know therefore, understand from the going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 it shall be built again with squares and a moat, but in a troubled time. After the 62, an anointed one shall be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and its sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. Remember, Daniel has said, God, why is your place desolate? God, he says, look, desolations are decreed. The temple will be rebuilt, but it will also be destroyed again. Jesus points to this in Matthew chapter 24. In multiple places, Jesus calls himself the temple. He says not one stone is going to be left upon another. When he looks at the temple, he says this is all going to be torn down. Symbolic of Jesus saying, look, the temple is no longer needed because I am the temple. You see what's happening? And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end, there's that word decreed again, is poured out on the desolator. God's plan is permanent. See, the the importance of verses 25 through 27 is really Gabriel could have just stopped at the purpose and said, here's these things that God's going to do. The reason verses 25 through 27 are important is because it puts salvation in a historical setting. See, our salvation was not worked out in some sort of ethereal. That's the thing about apocalyptic prophecy. It's not just up there in the heavens, not able to be understood or reached by us. God works in human history to save his people. 
And that's why we get this historical laying out of how these things are going to happen. In verse 25, what we see are the sort of the first two stages, and it speaks of the restoration and rebuilding of Jerusalem, which is if you read, it talks about it being in a troubled time. And if you read the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, you see the restoration and rebuilding of Jerusalem and the sanctuary, but it's in a very troubled time. So Gabriel comes to Daniel and says, look, God's got a plan. He is going to rebuild the temple. He is going to rebuild Jerusalem as a city. But what do we know ultimately happens to Jerusalem in the future? Like for Daniel, what would ultimately happen even after it was rebuilt? It's raised to the ground again. Jesus told about it in Matthew chapter 24. He told that this was coming. He actually refers back to Daniel when you see the, uh, the abomination of desolation taking place. When you see that standing in the sanctuary, flee to the mountains, run to Judea, get out of here. <laughs> it's all coming down, right? Jesus says that in Matthew chapter 24. But in verse 25, this would have been an encouragement to Daniel, at least temporarily, that God says, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise the temple again. But listen, here's the deal. Why did God destroy the temple again? When Christ was sent among his people, who rejected Jesus? Who called for Jesus' crucifixion? In the book of Acts, where's the first place the gospel goes? To the Israelites. Why does the gospel go to the Gentiles? Because the Israelites reject it. Look, I don't believe this text is talking about God saying to Daniel, hey, I'm going to make my name great through national Israel. I think this text is about God saying to Daniel, I'm going to make my name great. It's going to be painful for you and for your people. In verse 26, we get the synopsis of the final week, which the, the break here, when we see these things, the reason it's sort of broken down into, well, why does it say, you know, seven and then 62 and then seven? I, I do think that this signifies a break where important things are happening. Remember, these are symbolic numbers. From, from an understanding of symbolic numbers, it's just symbolic of important things happening at these breaks. And in verse 26, uh, we see sort of a synopsis in the final week um, and, and the destruction of the temple, which is most likely A.D. 70. And, and just incidentally, I think it's, it's also so, somewhat comical to me when we in this time begin to speak of things as being worse than they've ever been in human history. Now listen, if you know anything about Titus, destruction, Titus and his destruction of the temple uh, and after the rebellion of the Jews, you tell me when in America we see people being crucified outside of buildings like men, women, and children being openly crucified in front of people and the buildings being completely tore down, then I will agree with you that this is the worst time in history. Until stuff like that happens, I can't get on board with that. Listen, things have always been bad because there's always been sin. Amen? They've always been bad. So we as Christians have to, have to be careful to, to yes, and, and we'll talk about this here in a second, to, to understand that someday God is going to consummate these things finally. But listen, when he says desolations are decreed, we have to understand that even in the worst things happening in the world right now, God is not oblivious and God is not out of control. He will do everything in his own time. As Cowper said, God is his own interpreter. He will make it plain. We don't need to know when those things are happening. Even Jesus himself, and, and here's where we're going we're to end here. One of the things that I, I just want to share with you is R.C. Sproul in this book. And I want, I want to recommend a book to you before we leave today. It's called Mighty Christ by R.C. Sproul. If you've never read it, it's a short book, easy read, wonderful truth in it. And I would recommend it highly, Mighty Christ. R.C. Sproul says, if people understood that there is a holy God and that sin is an offense against him, they would be asking, what must I do to be saved? See, all of these things that are happening in the world right now are not the best opportunity for us as Christians to say, okay, God, when are you going to wrap it all up? They're the best opportunity for us to tell others, unless you repent, you too shall perish. It's an opportunity for us to point them to the one who has already made himself known in human history, Right? We as Christians, we're like, things are really, really bad. When is God going to make it all right? When is God going to deal with sin? Folks, he has dealt with sin. And we want to run right through the cross to the end of the world when we could be declaring to people, God has dealt with sin. He has dealt with sin in his son, Jesus Christ. And if you repent and put your faith in Jesus, you too can be saved. Amen. That's good news. It's not just abandoned ship, get out of here. It's we can tell people God is not just waiting to work in the future. He has worked in Jesus. Don't run through the cross on your way to trying to figure out when the end of the world is. Just three quick things as we leave today. 
The problem of sin is not other people's problems. See, that's what we do too as Christians. Sometimes we just point at the world as terrible because there's all these terrible people in it. But we have to be realistic and say that the problem of sin is not just the problem of the other people out there. It's our problem. So three quick things. First, don't refuse him who is speaking. Do not refuse him who is speaking. Jesus speaks in the mess of the world that there's a price to pay for sin and that Christ has paid it for those who will trust in him. And if you look at Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, specifically verse 25, see, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. Friends, if you are here today and there's fear about what's to come and there's fear about how messed up the world is, don't miss the force for the trees. God has displayed his son as the atonement for sin. Don't refuse him who's speaking. You could be sitting there right now thinking about how terrible your life is, how much you would love for God to work and change things, but God has worked. And the thing that needs to be changed is not just the circumstances around you. The thing that needs to be changed is your heart towards God. And when he changes your heart and makes himself your joy, then we can say in those circumstances, God, do what you will for your glory. George Whitfield says that really an unapplied Christ is no Christ at all. What he says is, listen, unless Christ has been brought home to your heart, you can hear about Christ till the cows come home and it will never change you. Unless God by work of his Holy Spirit through faith applies Christ to your heart. It's not just hearing about Jesus, it's bowing the knee before him. The second thing that we can, can pull out of this text is that we should always be ready for Christ's return. Jesus himself says this, that his, his apostles say to him, when are these things going to happen? How do, how do we know when these things are going to happen? Jesus says ultimately here, look, you don't know. Jesus said even he didn't know. Now if Jesus didn't know, I don't know why we're still trying to figure out the timeline of this stuff. He says, look, angels don't know. I don't know. The son doesn't know. Only the father knows. Be ready. 2 Peter 3, 8 through 13, don't overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day, here's the symbolic numbers too, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow <clears throat> to fulfill his promise, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God in his sovereignty, guys, the reason that Jesus didn't come back right now this morning is God is sovereignly giving unbelievers a chance to repent. And if, if we as believers don't see the beauty in that, I, 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 I'm worried about us and whether or not we really, truly know Christ. It's not his will, not wishing that any should perish says, talks about how all these things will be burned up and, and a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells will be given. And there's our third point. In all of these apocalyptic texts, the one thing that we can do is marvel at God's glorious work in history. Look at Revelation 22, 1 through 5. And I know we've spent a lot of time in this today. I hope, I hope it's been beneficial for us. Revelation 22, 1 through 5, Then the angel showed me the river, the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding each, its fruit in each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of all the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Daniel says, God, when are you going to make your name great? God says, I'm going to do it. He does it through Jesus Christ. He makes his name great. Christ does these wonderful things in which he puts an end to sin. He, he ushers in everlasting righteousness. And for those who have trusted in Christ and Christ alone, one day we will be able to see face to face our Lord who has made everything right for the glory of his own name. Amen. It's good news. It's good news. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we can spend together in your word. Lord, we ask that you would make us humble. Lord, humble us at your word. Help us to understand that it's, it's not, our understanding is flawed. It's imperfect. Lord, let us let your word rule. 
Father, I do pray that there, if there are any in here who have never bowed the knee to you, may today be the day of salvation that they would not refuse he who is speaking. And he who is speaking is Jesus Christ as he calls out, repent and believe. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you that your ways are far above our ways, Lord. And as much as we would like to figure out everything that you're doing in human history, to a certain extent, we, we just have to trust that you will put yourself on display for your glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. this week as we make our way into, you know, our community. When these things come up about, you know, what's going on in the world right now and all these terrible things that are happening, what we do a lot of times, we allow people to run straight to like, what's going to happen? In the Look, we can use this as an opportunity to point out to them that the problem with the world is sin and the solution that God has given us for the problem of sin is in his son, Jesus Christ. It's gospel opportunity. We don't freak out and start panicking about the end of the world. We tell them that God has worked in human history in the greatest way possible by making himself known to us in his son. Amen? So let's, let's instead of freaking out and panicking and trying to figure out the end of the world, let's just go out and tell others that God has determined all things and in his sovereignty, he's dealt with the problem of sin in Jesus Christ. You're dismissed.